Yeah, this is the inescapable confrontation of our time, isn't it? Mm. And I call it the long dark, not because it's um, depressing, but because it's necessary. And the alchemical traditions, um, which I love, because the, the metaphors in this tradition are so helpful for what we're encountering in this time. They would talk about a period that's necessary for, for, for the soul work to begin, and they call it the negredo, the blackening. But what I, what I honor about the long dark is that it tells us that certain things can only happen in the darkness. And certain pieces of work are happening collectively. The, the breakdowns of capitalism, of, of uh, systemic racism, of economic disparities, of, of gender biases and, and, and cruelties. These systems must collapse. They have to collapse because they do not serve life. They do not serve the generative capacities of life. So I'm very much looking forward to speaking to Francis Weller today. Um, I first came across Francis' work just a couple of years ago via his book, The Wild Edges of Sorrow, Rituals of Renewal and the Sacred Work of Grief. And for me personally, that was really revolutionized my, uh, my understanding of grief and changed how I approach it. And, um, it also gave me tremendous comfort and a sense of purpose as well. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to introduce him a little bit more formally. So Francis is a psychotherapist for 40 years, a writer having published three books now with another in process, I believe, and is a soul activist. He has introduced the healing power of ritual to many thousands of people. He also founded and directs Wisdom Bridge, an organization that often that offers educational programs that seek to integrate the wisdom from indigenous cultures with the insights and knowledge gathered, gathered from Western poetic, psychological, and spiritual traditions. So welcome, Francis, and thank you for, for taking the time to meet with me. Delighted to be here with you, Michael. Thanks for having me. Mm. So in the preface uh, to your book, you say bringing grief and death out of the shadows is our spiritual responsibility and our sacred duty. And I really feel that in you and have had that same impulse lifted in me, I think, by being in contact. But I had to wonder, like, what brings you into this field in the first place? It's not something that that necessarily people gravitate to. So so what is it that, 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 that brought you here into this work? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, there's multiple threads. One of them is uh, kind of the melancholy atmosphere that I think I was raised in. Uh, my father had a very large stroke when I was 15 or so, and there were a lot of familial deaths around. And it was a kind of a somber family atmosphere. Mm. There was also the feeling of of losing my own sense of being. Uh, so there was like this underlying ground of absence from my own vitality. But characterologically, I think I have just been claimed by soul. Mm -hmm. This is the ground I can't get away from. I mean, I'm not the I'm not the fun guy at the party. <laughs> we talk about shame and defeat and grief and loss and yeah, party time. Um, but it's something that I feel I I have to have a certain fidelity to. So my life has been claimed by that. And also then being a psychotherapist for 40 years, you really begin to see that underlying almost every issue, whether that's relational issues or depression or addiction, is a tremendous amount of loss. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have a language for dealing with grief. We didn't have a soul approach. We had a, a clinical approach, which was more treating like treating depression, either medications or how do we get rid of this? Mm -hmm. But we didn't see an underlying thread of soul that was moving through the symptom. Mm -hmm. So after sitting with so many, many people for so many years, uh, you, you can't 
escape the gravity of what sorrow asks you to attend to. Mm. So it's just been it's been the the waters I've swum in for mm. decades. Mm. Look, there's there's quite a bit to respond to in what you say there, but just to set the table because we're going to be talking more about this as we go on. What do you mean by soul? Because so many spiritual traditions have so many ideas about that, and you talk about it in a particular way that I think I understand. But what, when you say, you know, you, you soul drew you to this, what do you mean by that? Well, that's a fundam <clears throat> fundamental question because it, it does have so many associations. How I speak about soul is more out of the um, archetypal psychology traditions of Jung and Hillman in particular, and the romantic poets, the uh, traditional cultures. Um, so I'm speaking about it more as a dimension of depth, whereas spirit oftentimes is a rising, ascending quality. Soul is a descending, imminent quality that brings us into what's vulnerable, mm -hmm. what is tender, mm -hmm. where grief and loss live, where longing, where our most intimate moments are shared. We have a soulful conversation. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a moment of great depth we just shared, where we're talking about a quality. So I'm speaking of soul more qualitatively than some type of metaphysical mm -hmm. uh, ideology. Yes. So it's more of an experience mm. um, that we recognize. And that's why I wrote the book primarily was to try to bring soul back to grief work mm. and grief back to soul work. So it has that quality of, you know, what is it that we all share in common? Mm. This is what I call the commons of the soul. Mm. There's nobody you'll ever meet in your entire lifetime that will not have a profound encounter at some point with loss. But when we don't have a language for it or an approach to it that isn't so much uh, medical or um, heroic, but actually one that allows us to sink into the, the inky black waters of sorrow, mm. then we have a language. We have a, a way of understanding one another. Mm. When we gather in ritual space to address the commons of the soul, there's no question. We're all on the same territory. Mm. we're all side by side weeping together mm. we all know the ground mm. and that that's a very soulful territory mm. the singing we do the movements the tears that is soulful mm. yep. in, without yep. question mm. in my in my language mm. yeah. i mean it's so beautiful listening to you because i think you're someone when you speak about this that experience lips in me I, I i absolutely understand what you're saying and i think grief has been approached more from um the sense of spirit than soul <laughs> and um like how do we ascend above this and how do we get past this and how do we end this and how do we come back to who we truly are which is happy and expansive you know that you know that's been more the approach that i understood before I found your work. And um, I, I personally am very grateful that you're speaking on behalf of soul and its, and its place in the human psyche. Mm. It was very uh, illustrative. I, I was asked to do a day-long in-service for a mindfulness meditation training group. And we did a lot of work with grief. And at the end of it, the leader of the institute says, we've, we've never dealt with this before. We've never talked about grief. Mm. And that tells us something about kind of this, this split mm. of, of this rising, ascentive quality. And I have no judgments about that. We need that. I can get too lost in soul. Mm. I can get mired down in the heaviness and the weightiness and the messiness of soul i need those spiritual practices to you know lift me up out of that periodically but we're so heavily weighted on spirit side there's spiritual centers all across the united states you know even in the territories you wouldn't even think of finding it like you know i want to say that's <laughs> so true but there's meditation centers yoga centers <laughs> uh 
you know, temples. There's, they're everywhere, but find a place of soul. Mm -hmm. That's harder to find. Yes. You, know, yes. you might find I... it at a jazz club or, a, you know, yeah. Black Baptist church, but yeah. they're much harder to find. It's it's so true. I, I'm just thinking as you say that, it's almost like, um, I mean, this is more true in Australia than America, but the pub, you know, People go to the pub and want to have those conversations, but it's the wrong place in the wrong setting. <laughs> and uh, but it's an attempt, you know. It's an attempt, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and look, I, I want to head into the area that I most want to be with you on today. And it's the, it's the, it's a heavy, heavy field. And it goes by many names. Um, climate change, the climate crisis, the poly crisis, the great unraveling, the great simplification. There's so many names for it, uh, but we might disagree on how fast it's coming, but nobody really can argue now that it's coming. It's, it's unavoidable. You are someone, you know, in listening to you that feels the losses uh, in the natural world as deep as anyone that I've heard. And you have your own name for this time called The Long Dark. And I'd love you to talk about that and what you mean by that and where, where that takes you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the inescapable confrontation of our time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I call it The Long Dark not because it's um, depressing, but because it's necessary. In the alchemical traditions, um, which I love, because the, the metaphors in this tradition are so helpful for what we're encountering in this time, they would talk about a period that's necessary for, for, for the soul work to begin, and they call it the negredo, the blackening. And they called negredo the, the subtle dissolver, but well, we're not having such a subtle dissolution right now. It's quite, <laughs> quite robust. Um, but what I what I honor about the long dark is that it tells us that certain things can only happen in the darkness, and certain pieces of work are happening collectively. The, the breakdowns of capitalism, of, of uh, systemic racism, of economic disparities, of, of gender biases and, and, and cruelties, these systems must collapse. They have to collapse because they do not serve life. They do not serve the generative capacities of life. The other thing about the long dark is that um, the idea is gestational. There are things happening right now that we have no idea of what's happening in the dark. Mm -hmm. Like when you look at everything in, in the world, everything alive in the world is because of what's happening in the darkness. Mm -hmm. The trees are there because of the mycelia and the microbes and the root systems. And mm -hmm. our hearts, we're alive right now because of what's happening in the darkness of our own chest, mm -hmm. the heartbeat. Mm -hmm. um, but we're so enamored with light that we have neglected the sacredness that's happening in the darkness. And this is a return, this is a compelling return to the holiness that dwells in the dark. Mm -hmm. uh, Rainer Maria Rilke had a phrase from one of his poems. He said, and yet, no matter how deeply I go down into myself, my God is dark and like a webbing made of a hundred roots that drink in silence. Mm -hmm. So this is almost like a, a, literally a crash course in a restoration of a deep uh, soul um, reconciling mm -hmm. what it is we've neglected, abandoned, uh, mm -hmm. betrayed. Mm -hmm. um, and the long dark will not be a couple of years. It's going to be probably multiple generations. Mm -hmm. You and I will probably not see the far end of this process. Mm -hmm. But there are some young ones alive now that may still be here in 2070 when this period may begin to show some signs of the um, 
the birthing of a living culture. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that's going to be able to sustain us is living culture. Mm -hmm. Because living culture lives in reciprocity. Mm -hmm. It lives in mutuality with living systems. And the long dark is this profound time of decay, of compost, of gestation, and sustained imagination. There's a wonderful idea that comes out of the Inuit tradition called Kartsaluni. Mm. I love Kartsaluni. this word. I've heard you talk about this. I just love it. So, so go on, please. Kartsaluni, um, the term translates into sitting quietly together in the dark, waiting expectantly for something creative to occur. <laughs> Look, just when you say that, part of me goes, Oh, you know, wouldn't I love to be in that, you know, when nobody knows what's happening and everyone's sitting in their depth. This is, I have some longing arise. Yes, yes, because that space is more receptive than it is. Um, we're trying to always push something, an agenda, an idea. Again, nothing wrong with that. But we have failed to do something corrective, which is to stop, mm -hmm. to listen to go to our knees, to weep together, to crack the heart open, and then to get silent. This is a time of profound humility. We don't know what's happening. We see all the signs, and the signs are pretty clear of what's happening in terms of you know, carbon dioxide and extinctions and water, sea level rises. And we know all the signs, but we don't know how to stop the addiction of action and become humble enough to say we have to listen to be informed about how to live here again mm -hmm. as human beings. We suffer from, like I, like I wrote about in the Wild Edge of Sorrow, the two primary sins are amnesia and anesthesia. Mm -hmm. We forget and we go numb. Mm -hmm. And we go numb because we have forgotten. And this forgetting has been almost wholesale. You know, we rarely know, I forget this study that they showed a, a sheet of paper to a, a group of children of, that had logos on them. And then they showed them a sheet of paper with various trees on them. And of course the kids could name almost all the logos, but they didn't know almost a single tree. Wow. What tree is this? Wow. What are we being educated to, but consumption? <laughs> You know, to consume mm. out of a profound sense of emptiness, mm. which is really at the heart of all of our grief, is a profound, lingering sense of emptiness. Oh, I've got I've got two questions that are coming simultaneously um, on very different kind of aspects of what you were just saying. Um, I mean, one question that comes because we're, we're, I live in this culture, I, I'm a part of this culture, um, I turn on the lights, I get in my car, I buy things from the supermarket that have been made, you know, who knows where, you know what I mean? I, I am another consumer in a consumptive society. And, um, and so I have, alongside everything, shame and uh, shame can get in the way of grieving because I know I'm a part of it. So, mm -hmm. so I, I've heard you talk about this, and I, I'd love you to just elucidate that a little bit around how we manage that. Well, it's somewhat inescapable, right? If we're having this conversation right now because of our reliance on the technology and See. electricity and. Mm -hmm. um, so the thing for me is, what is it that I really want? What is it that the soul really wants? I mean, what it wants is the primary satisfactions, the things that shaped us over hundreds of thousands of years. These primary satisfactions are sharing meals together, singing together, telling stories at night around the fire, grieving together when there's been loss or suffering, giving thanks when we have been blessed by a good hunt or a good you know, harvest or whatever, starlit nights, 
sharing our dreams in the morning. You know, when we are inside of primary satisfaction, we're not wondering what the next purchase is going to be. This economic structure would collapse almost instantaneously if we lived according to primary satisfaction. Mm -hmm. I just did a, a weekend, one of the first weekends in a long, long time uh, in a little town called Grass Valley in Northern California. And a lot of our work was around grief. and um, But what you could feel as the sensation of village mind began to settled into the room over the three days. The, the amount of times that you ran to your cell phone disappeared. We were singing together. We were sharing meals together. We were doing all the things I just mentioned. And we wept together and brought and welcomed each other back from the shrine and um, helped restore the sense of our own wholeness. Mm. And when that's being nurtured, that the last thing you want to do is, you know, get online and go to Amazon. Mm. You're content. Mm. It's as if the culture that we live in is chronically attempting to generate discontent mm -hmm. and to feed off of our emptiness. Mm. So true. You know, I, I think about, you know, in America, we're the largest consuming culture on the planet. Mm. Why is that? What is it that we're trying to compensate for by stuff? We have more belongings, but we don't feel like we belong. <laughs> so true. So that's a really, that's at the heart of all my work is to re, re, reimagine and regenerate the primary satisfactions, mm -hmm. to re-knit the fabric of belonging, to um, reanimate the ritual ground, which is the primary language for addressing what it means to be human. Um, so what, like I say, when those things are being touched, um, we're not going to consistently consume like we are. We're not going to strip the earth <sighs> out of every inch of it. Mm -hmm. I I I am I am understanding something new as you say that there that and and more about why you talk about yourself as being a soul activist because it's not just grief work you know it's grief work exists within soul work yes? that's right yes that's perfectly said Michael yeah yeah what is the context what's the primal matrix mm. that we abandoned mm. much to our detriments mm. and relied more on individualism than on mm. communal mind on, on village mind mm. so yes we have to we have to reconnect with that primal matrix to do the grief work to do the gratitude work mm. to do the reclaiming work to do the restoring of soul of the world work all of these things nest inside of that wider context mm. of community and and soul you know, as you're saying that, I just noticed that, you know, I, I, this sort of wave of sadness come um, unexpectedly. Um, I, I just got to keep my mind on the job here. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, let's, let's just, let's honor what's being touched right now, mm. because what you're touching, I would imagine any one of your listeners may also feel that same sense of of the of the profound impact of our amnesia. Uh, yeah. I mean I guess that's the um it's the loneliness of our culture that yes. that is just uh I don't know what word describes it. It's it's harsh, it's frightening actually how lonely our culture is. You know, and I'm a connective person. It's not like I don't have friends. Yeah. Yeah. But the setup, yeah, I um, I, I want to talk about another aspect of what interferes with the grief journey. And, you know, you were talking about 2070 and the next generations. And, and this, this may or may not be so because there's many and I may be one of them that thinks what's coming is much more, uh, which much faster and, and much more all pervasive. And then what can often happen when I'm in 
the grief of our culture or the grief of our destruction, what enters next to that is fear. And, and sometimes the fear takes over, so I don't know what's grief and what's fear. And uh, I don't feel I'm particularly useful in those moments. Uh, and I don't, if, I, if my work was about anything, it's like, how do we meet what's coming without running around being frightened and dangerous and violent as whatever changes come? So mm -hmm. grief feels like a much uh, more productive place to be, but I don't always know how to make that movement. That's an essential question again, Michael. I think what we have to do is keep an adult presence. And that's not always easy to do. Mm. Typically, when fear or grief arrive, we suddenly feel very young and very small and overwhelmed, as, as if the adult has just been displaced by a five-year-old. Because that's the, probably the last time any of us had our grief and maybe our fear held adequately. And I see this all the time in my practice, but also at grief rituals. When those, when the when the surge of grief rises up, suddenly you see the face change, and there's this panic that comes in. And what I have to do in that moment is say, "Can you be with the panic?" Which helps you to do a very essential thing, which is to separate from the fear, and then turn toward the fear and become a place of holding for that fear, you know? So that, that essential move, again, going back to alchemy, they said one of the primary practices, the primary operations in the alchemical process is separatio, the separating out of the elements. What's here? Jung once said that you cannot heal, but you cannot separate from. Mm -hmm. So when that fear arises and you're completely possessed by the fear, there's nobody there but fear. <laughs> and you become basically uh, non-functional. <laughs> and you can't get to the grief. You know, so I have to practice separating and coming back to an adult presence. <laughs> turn towards the fear. Give it a bottom. Give it a place of feeling held. <laughs> and then begin to understand why there's so much fear around grief. Well, partly because you've been told you have to carry it alone. You have to carry it alone? Yes. Yeah. And when you think about the, as we've been describing, the enormity of the grief about what is happening to the planet, how the hell are you supposed to carry that by yourself? You know, when I first started doing grief rituals back in the late 1990s, up until about, I don't know, well, after I published the book, 2015, there'd be like a, two or three people in the circle who were there because of earth grief. Hmm. Now, well over half of them are there because of this. Wow. You know, people come because of the death of a child or a partner or cancer diagnosis or, or all the legitimate reasons for coming to a grief ritual. But most of them are there now because of this overwhelming sorrow. Hmm for what is befalling our earth. Mm -hmm. But left again to yourself, by yourself, thank God we have capacity to go numb. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Because the heart all by itself, facing that, you know, wave of grief, it, it can't do it. That's why we have to come back again and again to the grief shrine together. Mm -hmm. In the same culture, if we were in a sane culture, there'd be grief rituals every week or two mm. in the center of the town. Mm. And we would gather and we would cry and we would weep. Mm. And out of that place, some mysterious thing could emerge out of the broken heart, which is our love again for this world. Mm -hmm. I think it's the broken heart that might save us. But if we're all alone, we can't risk opening the broken heart. Mm. You see the predicament we're in. Mm. 
the heart is registering the sorrows of the world, mm. but frequently in isolation, solitary mm. confinement. Mm. And so it's 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 being asked to do too big a job. Mm. So we have to gather again and again in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our, you know, in our parks, and begin to just allow our collective wail mm. to really begin to be felt. Because it also then adds to our courage. At the end of the grief ritual, well, our closing, you know, prayer basically, I, I say, you know, we we didn't do this just for ourselves. We did this so our hearts could break open and we could walk into the street and into the forest with our hearts more open to love this world ardently mm. and to do whatever we can, mm. any small gesture mm. to add to the cumulative possibility mm. that she might endure. Yeah. She may not. We we don't know. Yes. But it's up to us, right, to respond. Mm. I have two young grandkids now, 10 and 6 years old. I can't look at them without crying. Yes. But do I give up? Mm -hmm. I'm having this conversation with you today because I haven't. Mm -hmm. You know, because I, I am loving this world more now at 67 yes. than I did yes. at any other point in my life. Yes. Because my heart is willing to register the grief. Mm -hmm. It's also then capable of acknowledging the astounding beauty that is still everywhere I look. From the gross beaks singing in the morning, you know, to the dug firs and the redwoods. And... I was on the beach this morning. I live in a small coastal town, uh, Eastern Australia. I was on the beach this morning as the sunrise. And, you know, just, it's so beautiful. And sometimes when it's so beautiful, it's hard to believe that anything else could be happening but the beauty. Then as my day goes on, <laughs> it doesn't take long to realise. And um, look, you talked about the young people, but I want to go back a step because I've got a question about them as well, but I want to go back a step because one of the things that I have learnt from your work that was the one of the key transformational pieces for me because western culture i think we've grown up or i've grown up um with the elizabeth kubler ross model of the five stages of grief and you know obviously the, there's a there's a journey and you get to the end and the end is acceptance right and if you're caught somewhere back there then you better hurry up and move along and um and you know good luck with this journey and i hope you make it out to acceptance whereas your model is we should be coming to these rituals again and again and again and again and we're not looking necessarily for an end to this process we're looking to stay with this process so love you to say something about that oh i think that is so key um and you know elizabeth did such important work of breaking our denial around death and looking at death and and beginning to understand that there is a process around grief but she's talking primarily around the death of someone you love. But our grief that we're talking about is ubiquitous. Every single day, you will be confronted with multiple forms and shades of grief, from homelessness to mm. roadkill on the side of the road to we drove up to uh, Oregon to help our family um, had a death in it. And, but we drove through multiple clear cuts and the assault on the soul was so, I mean, this is around us constantly. You know, we see, we hear about people, people of color being murdered and there is no end to this grief. Mm -hmm. So there is no acceptance. What there is, is an apprenticeship. We must take up an apprenticeship with sorrow. Otherwise these, constant engagement with grief will be too much. And so we have to take up this apprenticeship because, uh, again, and if I'm going to stay alive and open to life, then I have to know how to be with this constancy of sorrow. Mm -hmm. And I have to build up my internal 
capacities to be with it. And I like this idea, this image of, of apprenticeship, you know, for many hundreds, thousands of years or so, there's this apprenticeship system where you, you basically signed up to be taught over a long period of time, sometimes five, 10 years, 15 years, how to be a stonemason or a painter or a carpenter or a weaver or a potter. And you just devoted yourself. That led to a state they called mastery. You became a master craftsperson. Well, in soul language, that apprenticeship doesn't lead to mastery, it leads to elderhood. Mm -hmm. Someone who has sustained that apprenticeship for a long time mm -hmm. and kept being buffeted and reshaped by the constant presence of grief. And over that time, recognized that grief wasn't there to destroy, but to ripen mm -hmm. and deepen them. Mm -hmm into someone who could stand and look into the eyes of the young ones and say, I see what it is you're carrying right now. Mm -hmm. And I will not turn away from that. Mm -hmm. I will. I don't have answers for it, mm -hmm. but I can stand here and say what you're feeling is true, is real, mm -hmm. it's legitimate, and we have failed you. Mm -hmm. Elderhood is something that we're also lamenting, right? It's profound absence of... Mm -hmm capable adult human beings who are able to keep the the, the, um, the gyre of grief moving. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't just settle on us like sediment, oppressing us, deadening mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. but keeping it moving mm -hmm. so that we stay alive and still stay in love with this world mm -hmm. and still do, you know, doing whatever we can for its yeah. audacious being. It's such a beautiful definition of elderhood, what you describe there, mm. because I, I think not only do we not have elders, uh, you know, we have an absence of elders, but we also, when you were speaking, I was just feeling we actually, the definition of what an elder is completely fuzzy as well. It's almost like in in some part of my mind, an elder is someone who knows a lot you go to get information do you know what I mean and that you know in a sort of semi-spiritual way they might you know say you know good luck my son but but um what you're talking about the elderhood you're talking about there is that really deep seeing that deep capacity to be with and to help other people be with yes mm. I mean ultimately there are no answers but there is a response. Mm. You know, we don't, we can't figure this out, but we can respond. We can respond with to each other with kindness, with compassion. We can respond with holy outrage mm. to what is happening. Mm. You know, we can respond and do what we can to repair uh, mm. and to prevent more harm. Mm. But that requires someone who's willing to both feel the grief of what's happening mm. and to find the courage in the grief to respond. And yeah. that is really what I think is at the heart of elderhood. Mm. Holy outrage. Something about that really touches me. And, you know, I I want to go back a, a step to what you were talking about a, a moment ago with the young ones. And, you know, I, I, like I, I don't have children of my own, well, none that are alive anyway. But um, mm. I don't... Uh, I, I used to work with kids. I spent about 10 years working with kids, but I can't talk about what's coming without feeling so much grief for the young ones. Like talking about it takes me somewhere. Um, and there is this sense of like, how do I not talk to the young ones about this, but how do I be with them about this? Like, um, I, I can't expect young people to be able to grieve when they're just coming into themselves. I, I, I don't know what to, I don't know how, I don't know how to respond to young ones. I think it's part of my grief. Well, I, I don't know if there's a one size fits all response to that. Mm -hmm. uh, each one will have their capacity to mm -hmm. uh, digest what is happening. Some of them, it's, it's, they can't. And so they turn away and find distractions. Mm -hmm. And God knows we have 
uh, a me a social media based on distraction and uh, how to basically distract ourselves from the pain of what's here. But more and more at our gatherings, like this one this past weekend, there's a large number of young people there. Mm -hmm. And what we can do is honor and validate what their experience is. Mm -hmm. I also work with the Cancer Help Program twice mm -hmm. a year at Commonweal here in California. Mm -hmm. And frequently there are young parents there dealing with serious cancer diagnosis, some of them terminal. And they have, you know, you know, five, 10, 15 year old kids at home. And they'll often say, well, we don't talk about it because um, we don't want them to be scared. We don't want them, you know, sad all the time. And I said, do you think they don't know that mom can't get off the couch, that she's lost all her hair? that she has to go to these appointments over and over again. Do you think they don't know? So one of the things I think that's so important is to honor their perceptions. What are they seeing? What are they feeling? What are they sensing in their bodies? If we can at least say what you're feeling is true, what you're sensing, what you're imagining is actually right, that goes a long way to them to not feel disenfranchised, ignored, um, marginalized. If somebody in this adult body who's saying, yes, what you're feeling is absolutely right on. And again, not that we have answers for it, but we have space that we can hold it and let them grieve together. Mm. Let them acknowledge their fear, their sadness. And we can hold that with them and sometimes grieve right alongside with up with them. Yes. That, yes. That's incredibly, I was going to say healing. That's too big a word. It's at least honoring of what their experience is. We've handed them a shithole of an experience, you know. Um, and it's our, our responsibility to at least show up and say, Tell us how it is for you to be given this mm. broken situation. Mm. You know? Yeah. Gosh, it's, you well, know, I, yeah, go on. You know, someone, someone I really admire a lot, uh, she said, give them something to love. Mm. You know, like when my wife is playing with the grandkids. She's making mud balls with them at times. And um, she says, let's, let's just get them to love dirt. And there's something really homeopathic about that. You know, there's something alchemical about that, that if they could just love this little ball of mud in their hands, that's, that does something. You know, we don't have to have grand solutions because I don't think we have grand solutions, but we can do these little micro rituals of deepening affection. Wendell Berry gave a lecture some years ago uh, and he said it all, and the title of the talk was, It All Turns on Affection. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. We're not going to do anything for this earth out of moralism, the should of it. Mm -hmm. We will respond out of affection. So I love this idea of give them something to love, whether it's music or friendship or uh, a watershed, you know, a tadpole, you know, something that stimulates their heart to say yes. That's, that's a counterweight to the heaviness of the time. And I've heard you also say um, we can demonstrate to them our grieving um, yes. so they can see us grieve and then understand that it's okay. Mm. Yeah, not only okay, but you no, know, it is necessary mm. in order for us to stay alive. Mm. I think you maybe read that passage in my book once about... Um, Grief is not a deadening thing. It's, it's alive. 
it is feral. It, you cannot domesticate it. And if you're going to shut down the access places to grief, then you have to correspondingly diminish your own vitality. But this is sort of core, I think, to something that you're saying too. I love the, talking about the feralness of grief. Uh, I love that. But there is there is a sense that it's grief that deadens us, you know, that, it, you know, acceptance and um, joy is the life and the sadness deadens us. And when you talk about the feralness of grief, there's a whole other language that starts to come in about where the life is. Well, I remember my friend uh, Richard at once, we were driving back from a conference. I can't remember if this I wrote about this or not, but he asked me if I was happy. And I said, well, I have moments of being happy, which I'm grateful for. So, but what I want is to be alive. And I have times of being sad and angry and heartbroken and confused this is and all of those feelings have vitality in them and so my my work with people that i see isn't to make them happy for god's sake but to help them to recover their vitality their aliveness mm -hmm. and one of the things that is so vitally alive is grief if you've ever been to a grief ritual that room is humming when the when the grief ritual is happening it is stunningly alive because something so primal has been given permission to be expressed mm -hmm. side by side with anywhere from 20 to 40 to 100 people grieving together. And what's beautiful about it, Michael, is that somewhere towards, and we know when we're coming to the end, you can go to the shrine as many times as you want to in this ritual. And, that, and we know we're coming to the end. There's this infectious joy that begins to percolate through the circle because the heart has been unencumbered. The heart has been freed from this heaviness for a moment, anyhow. Tomorrow we'll start gathering more into the bucket. And that's why we have rituals regularly because we know this has to be emptied ongoing it's part of soul hygiene mm -hmm. we take care of our cars much better than we take care of our souls <laughs> but to get that oil changed every you know <laughs> let go of grief crying, mm -hmm. that would be good hygiene that would be good maintenance so we could stay alive that vitality would be with us all the time uh, that's what i think about grief work is it gets us current yes you know because most of us we're kind of facing our histories mm -hmm. we live always chewing on the bones of the past. And I think also generational bones mm -hmm. that haven't been digested. And we end up backing into the grave. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing grief work regularly, you get current. I'm here now. Mm -hmm. And in, in both senses of that word, we're also feeling the electricity, the current of life. Mm -hmm. And we're in the flow of life, in the current of life. You're not just chewing old bones and you know, never really getting here. So this, that's what I've seen with many people who come to the rituals mm. con continuously. So well put. It's so well put. I, I, I you know, I think you'll, you know, I, I've des I describe you as a grief teacher uh, mm. to friends of mine, but they're so rare. You know, your voice is so rare. It's not that you're the only one, but I can think of like two, maybe three, people that I know of on a, in a global sense that can speak this language. And um, I, I, I just feel such relief. I feel, uh, I, I feel the joy in me just listening to you talk about this, Francis, because the, the truth in it. Um, well, let me just jump in there real quick before you go on. Yeah. I would say that those are in the white community. There's so yes, few. Yes, yes. Because in the traditional cultures and, and cultures of color, there is tremendous access because they can't be in denial yes. about the grief. When mm. I, I spent some time in Africa with my friend Maladoma Some, and um, there was a grief ritual happening almost every day someplace in the village. Mm. And they were the most joyful people I have ever met. Yeah. yeah. 
and sure embodied, hey, eh? like like joyful embodied. Yes, yes. So what we're talking about is white capitalistic culture that it, there's very few of us talking about grief in that system. Yeah. But I want to honor all of the cultures that still sustain and maintain mm. the, the centrality of, mm. of, of communal ritual mm. and communal grieving. Look, I, I feel like um, any conversation with you, um, I can't go past what you've talked about uh, as the five gates of grief. I, mm. I need to include this. And one of the reasons that I really loved it, I, I felt like when you talk about it, how we talk about snow, but the Inuit have like 40 different words for snow. So we talk about grief and have sort of a, this singular idea so I loved you talking about the five gates of grief because it was experience. It was wisdom speaking to describe it in such a multi-layered way. And um, thank you for that work before you even talk about it. But could you just describe what you see as the five gates? Yeah, that that was a slow enunciation that came to me over sitting with groups for many years doing grief rituals. and. Uh, you began to see that people were coming not only because someone died, but all these other reasons were there. But those other reasons were never honored. They were never named. And you you weren't, your grief was not acknowledged other than for this first gate. So let me just name these gates and you'll see how the other gates of grief do not get acknowledged collectively. Mm -hmm. The first gate of grief is that everything you love, you will lose. It's a fierce gate. You get to hold on to nothing. Everything you love, you will lose, including your own incarnation. At some point, you will disappear. Yes, right. Our bodies, the people we love, our animals, the the you know planetary losses. Yes, everything goes. You know that's that in Buddhist idea of impermanence. Nothing lasts forever. Mm. People often say, well, I get to keep the memory of, their, of them with me. I said, well, that's only if you honor the rights of grief. Mm. Because the heart must stay soft mm. and warm mm. in order for that love to be registered. Mm. And if you deny the rights of grief, which is the other side of love, love and loss are inseparable. So if I'm going to love somebody, I have to accept that this is also part and parcel of this loving, is that I will lose you, you will lose me. There will be an end to this. So this is the gate at which someone can come up to you and say, I'm really sorry to hear about your loss. Mm. Whether that's a beloved animal friend or a child or a, mm. a marriage or a house or something that you love is no longer mm. within your grasp. Mm. And so we can say condolences to that one. Mm. Necessary, absolutely necessary. The second gate of grief, what I saw was the parts of us that have not known love. So we all are enculturated through educational systems, family systems, religious systems, economic systems. And they all tell us what parts of us are okay and what parts of us are not. So in my family system, anger was out, joy was out, exuberance, sensuality, uh, um, sadness. So I had to begin this process of cleaving, you know, getting rid of them, mm. the ones that were preventing my acceptance, or I should say my approval mm. within the family system. So of course, mm. the religious systems have their own uh, onerous uh, demands on who we get to be in education. Sit still, don't be so, you know, in economic systems, demand a certain obedience to a certain thin line of performance. Mm. So we begin to lose essential qualities of our being. And we begin to relate to these parts of ourselves with judgment mm. and contempt, mm. seeing them as worthless. Mm. I My first phrase out of my mouth almost to my therapist in my late 20s was, I want you to help me get rid of some parts of me. <laughs> I'm glad he failed. <laughs> oh, he failed, he failed miserably. <laughs> I don't think he ever bought the shtick, but uh, on on this on this, Francis, if if we have cleaved, because we have, um, yes. so 
there's parts of us that we don't even know that we're missing. We just shut down, yeah. right? So yeah. the grief that would come up would be unnameable somewhere. We wouldn't be able to name I'm grieving that part because we lost it, if you know what I mean. Sure. So then we have to look to a secondary cue, like, why am I judging that person for crying? Yeah. Uh -huh. Why do I envy that person for their joy? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a psychic response someplace in the system that says there's a gap here. Yeah. If I'm judging it, that typically means I'm holding it with contempt. Mm -hmm. If I'm envying somebody, it means I just, I wish I had lost, you know, I lost this piece like joy. Boy, I could, I, I could never have that. My therapist once said, you never tell me what you want. And I looked at him like I couldn't understand the question. Said, what? He said, you never tell me what you want. When I finally understood it, I said to him, I said, well, why would I? I'm never going to get it anyhow. You know, so I had to cleave off wanting mm -hmm. and live in this really flat line kind of life the first 40 years of my life. Uh, now, the problem with this, that every loss of an essential part of ourselves is a place of grief. But you cannot grieve for what it is you hold with contempt. So the first part is to begin to withdraw the judgment, mm -hmm. to make amends. You have to go out into that wasteland area and just sit there apologetically and say, I am so sorry that I blamed you for my not fitting into this world. Mm -hmm. In fact, without you, I will never fit into this world. Mm -hmm. We have to do what I call a Jane Goodall. Mm -hmm. You know, I understood initially, I thought how she would go out and sit on the jungle floor. I thought, well, she must have done that for months before the chimps came to her and let them touch and groom. And someone told me it was five years. Oh, wow. That is a long vigil. And are we willing to hold that kind of vigil for these parts of us until they trust us again? Because we've been pretty harsh. Mm. So shame is a huge thing at that second gate. Being told that these parts of me are unworthy, they're despicable, they don't fit. Um, and because we are such creatures that require at least some semblance of belonging, we're willing to do all that cleaving just so we don't become so isolated in the world that we just die, we just wither. Mm. So that's a small sacrifice to the, to the boy, to the child. But to the adult, that return has to be made so that I can live again here as a full human being. So mm -hmm. that's the second gate. We could spend a lot of time on that. Mm -hmm. We could spend a lot of time on each gate. <laughs> but I know we're, we're getting close to time here too. The third gate is the sorrows of the world. And this one, like we've been talking most of this time together, is growing and growing in its dimensionality. And not only, when I wrote, wrote about this, not only are we losing the world, you know, calving glaciers and species just disappearing. And, but we've also lost our, our sense of being in the world. I shared a beautiful quote in there from Paul Shepard. Uh, Paul was a human biologist. He um, spent most of his life exploring what, what was the evolutionary story that we've lived in and what happened when we split off from that sense of sacramental living and moved into economic living. Mm. And he said, we, we kind of hit our peak at, in the Pleistocene and we began the slow descent and now it's the rapid decline as we lost that sense of the sacramental world. But he, had, he was in, being interviewed by Jonathan White once in a book called, uh, it's called Talking on Water. I forget the question he was asked, but he said, his response just floored me, he said, the grief and sense of loss that we often attribute to a failure in our personality mm. is actually a feeling of emptiness mm. where a beautiful and strange otherness should have been encountered. Mm. Now, if we sat with that phrase for any length of time, we'd cry for a thousand years. Yeah. The grief and sense of loss. And he was he was smart. He said, you know, which we often attribute to a failure in our personality. Yes, I love that. 
You know, like, so, what did I do wrong to feel so yeah. empty and so alone? Is, is actually an emptiness where a beautiful and strange otherness should have been encountered. We're not talking to the world anymore. We're not in conversation with Wren and Raven or Larkspur or Kukubera. You know, we're not in conversation. We're in conversation with our cell phones and our computers and our gadgets and our TV sets. And, but we've stopped talking to the world. And something profound happens in that gap. Mm. Something deadens between us and the world. Mm. It's so true. Mm. Mm. Well, that's the third third yeah. gate of grief. Yeah, you're right. We could spend a long time on each gate. <laughs> They're all kind of uh, invitations into a deep oh, hole. Oh, my gosh, yes. And the fourth gate was kind of a surprise revelation. Mm. The fourth gate is what we expected and did not receive. Mm. And the fourth gate has to do with a lot with those primary satisfactions. R.D. Lang says we arrive here as Stone Age children. So we arrived here with this kind of psychic and genetic expectation of village. Because that's, that's what shaped us over several hundred thousand years. We were shaped by that. And we were expecting this encounter with something vivid and alive in the world. And almost none of that took shape. And what we were given instead was this individualistic economic system. But basically, you're on your own, buddy. And best of luck to you. And so a deep grief we carry is that those expectations for village life, for communal ritual, or for singing, and all those things that are deeply entangled with our genetic and, and psychic and spiritual makeup. Not there. And when I name that frequently in group settings, there is this profound recognition of that's at the heart of my sadness. Mm -hmm. I've been looking for a village my whole life, not even knowing I've been looking for a village my oh, whole life. Mm -hmm. you know, a place to belong without yeah. question. Yeah. And, and settling for the second rate uh, experiences of it, you know, barracking right. the football team, going to the football, you know, sense of belonging that is, you know, this, this these things that touch us in these ways that are such poor representations of what it could be, what it always has been, you know. Yes, yes. Well, you bring up a really good point, which is in the absence of primary satisfactions, we turn towards secondary satisfactions. Yes. Power, rank, mm. privilege, mm. wealth. You know, these are values in this country. We don't see them that they're actually symptomatic of a primary loss. Mm. We praise people who have got power, got wealth, got privilege, got rank. You know, they're the, they're the people we admire. But we don't see that actually as a profound symptom of a deep forgetting. That fourth gate of grief is enormous. Mm. And then the last gate is uh, ancestral grief. And the more I sit in circles with people, the more I feel like almost all grief is ancestral grief. That my shame didn't begin in this generation. I am the current curator of this grief, but it began many generations ago when the embedded indigenous culture of for me, the um, Germanic people, the Norse people, when that got dislodged by their Roman invasion and then by Christianity and all those things that usurped that, and we forgot our languages and we forgot our traditions, and we forgot the gods and goddesses, and we forgot the rituals, and we forgot the foods, that leads to a feeling of displacement and shame. And that has filtered down through my lineage into my body. Mm. So it isn't so much my shame, but it is the shame of what got lost and forgotten. So it's ancestral shame, mm -hmm. ancestral grief. And there's also, for people here, I think also in Australia, the, the deep, deep uh, an ancestral grief of what had happened to the traditional people. Mm -hmm. And for us, and the importation of slavery mm -hmm. 400 years ago, this is unmetabolized grief. And it's in our in our news every single day. Yes. Of yes. the fact that we haven't worked with this grief 
Mm. So it's maintaining, it's sustained. Mm. The wounding sustains itself because very few of us have been together to weep together, to acknowledge this grief and to honor it. And then because of the heart being broken open, begin the repair. Yes. That is that is necessary there. I mean, as you're saying that, I'm I'm sort of, you know, in this country, there's so much denial around what happened to the indigenous people. It's 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 both revolting and scary. And but it comes to me as you say that that we can't because we can't actually face the grief um, that we might feel uh, and and the how what how do we feel about our ancestors that have done this we have to face that as well so the the combination of those two things yeah and we don't have collective practices you know to really to gather and to do this work so mm. it's you know it's so individualized again and that's again part of what we're trying to do is to let the earth dream us back into Practices that help to repair and restore living culture. Mm. That's at the heart of the work. Mm. And, you know, I know you do in your work have, you know, the ongoing, you lead those ongoing groups. And um, I think there's more groups around the world that are starting. And, um, you know, I don't actually, I, I, I can direct people to your website I don't know how to direct people to grief groups necessarily. There's not that many of them happening, but it is my wish that they do. I do a version of it myself, but I but there needs to be more, doesn't there? There needs to be more and more of this. Well, there has to be the willingness to do it um, everywhere and anywhere. It's like, like I say to most people, well, well, can we can we do this again? I said, why wait? I don't have to be the one yes. sitting at the center of this. You can call four or five friends over into your home and say, tonight, we're going to talk about loss. Mm -hmm. And let's just make an agreement that we're not going to try to fix each other. Mm -hmm. No advice giving. Mm -hmm. Let's you know, maybe share a poem or light a candle, but let's just make a room that says it's all welcome here. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a three-day retreat like we do. Mm -hmm. It can be a three-hour around the table and then share a meal after that yeah. you know mm. and mm. We, we just need the, the courage and the permission i think people are just waiting for permission mm. and they're waiting for a space that's strong enough to hold what we're fearful of touching mm. Mm. Yeah. francis your words are just like so much nourishment mm. i i don't know how to put that any other way and um i i just Unfortunately, I, I feel like I could keep talking to you for so long, but we are out of time. And I, I just want to sincerely thank you for talking about the feral life in grief and for speaking up for soul work in a world so lost in spirit work. <laughs> and um, uh, what's that? A lot, of, a lot of it is self work, working on myself, self improvement, self mastery. It's, it's Spirit and self are the are the combination, and soul is kind of like the ugly stepsister. <laughs> doesn't get a doesn't get a lot of attention. So, did you say like the ugly sister? Did you is that what you said? I missed that. Yeah, yeah. So it's so true. It's yeah. so true. Um, really, just such a delight to to speak with you. I said just before we came on, what an honor it is uh, having seen so much of you on YouTube to actually have my own personal connection. This is rare. It's a rarer and rarer thing in the world. So, so very grateful for your work. Thank you for your time. And um, I hope we may do this again sometime. I would be delighted to do it, Michael. Thank you for having me and for really honoring the questions that they're at the core of what we're trying to address. Mm. Thank you. Well,